There is no shortage of items we have to get to over the next hour here on Big Ten Today, presented by Gatorade. I'm Anthony Heron. We are going to talk lacrosse. We are going to talk track and field with Kevin Sullivan. We're going to have a little bit of Iowa news that will come up later in the show as well. But also, the Big Ten men's baseball tournament is on and popping right now. And man, were they rolling here. So, our final big story of the season takes us to Omaha, where the Big Ten baseball tournament is down to six teams after Michigan State eliminated fifth-seeded Rutgers yesterday. Six to four, Iowa handed second-seeded Indiana their first loss of the tournament in a 9-4 victory, securing themselves a day off today. The last game of the night went a little bit longer than expected after a hefty weather delay and extra innings, but top-seeded Maryland knocked off Nebraska 2-1 to one in 10 thanks to Nick LaRusso's walk-off home run. So with that in mind, we figure it's a great opportunity to get to Scott Pose, who has been there on the scene in Omaha, calling the action for us here on the Big Ten Network. And I do wonder a bit, Scott, uh, because we talked last week leading into the tournament about some of the weather delays and the, the schedule being a bit different in preparation for this. And then last night, there's a lightning strike and everything has to stop. I'm wondering initially, did you have any flashbacks, any nightmares about what you went through last year? I did flash back to that when we got up out of the ballpark at 2 and 3 a.m. last year. I immediately thought of it. But if this is the worst that we have to deal with, we'll be okay. They kept everybody safe. We got the game in. It was an exciting game. But you can expect in the spring, in the Midwest, we're going to have some weather. Now, that final game that you called with Kevin Kugler, that was the game between Maryland and Nebraska. And the, the Dirty Terps offense has been one that's been statistically, in some categories, the best in college baseball throughout the season. Now we've seen them win back-to-back one-run pitchers duels last night in extra innings. Is there any positive to even though the offense struggling for, for Maryland, but they're finding ways to win? Well, it is, and they're serving notice because this is the way that you have to win in the NCAA tournament because Maryland has shown that they can outslug anybody, but the way they're winning here is how you have to play when you go to a super regional or host a regional. You're going to win one-run games by doing what they've done, play great defense and execute when you get runners on. They had runners on with nobody out that got them over. With one out, there was a runner at third. They found a way to get them in. And then Nick Russo coming up big. But what they're also doing very well is pitching extremely well. They got a great start from Nick Dean last night. Outstanding work from the bullpen. And even one of their starters, Jason Savakul, came in and nailed it down late. They're a team that is serving notice, and they're going to be tough in the regional and in this tournament. But them and I were sitting in the catbird seat right now. You mentioned that start from Nick Dean. I mean, he's a player who had struggled for a couple of starts coming into this. It certainly seems to be a positive sign for Maryland that he was able to recover. And, you know, he was really on the mound still all the way almost up until the weather delay before they finally pulled him with over 100 pitches. But the weather that was there, we saw, and you talked about it a lot throughout yesterday, where the ball, anything, any ball in flight seemed to be getting knocked down by the wind. So when Nick LaRusso makes contact with what ended up being the, the walk-off home run, what was your initial thought after seeing so many balls not leave the ballpark? I thought it was going to be another flyout. We had a bevy <laughs> of them last night, and the ball wasn't carrying. But LaRusso's got some pop. But to tell you how rare this is, that was the first walk-off home run at this ballpark in its history that's pretty impressive and it tells you that the ball doesn't carry at night especially late but it says two things it says it's tough but it shows the power that nick larusso has the guy's driven in nine runs this year he is an all-out slugger and he's getting it done for the turps now in another game earlier in the day both iowa and indiana had been fairly hot going into that game they'd won eight out of ten and iowa was down four to one in the seventh inning before surging late in that game. How impressed were you with the way that Iowa was able to close out those last couple of innings? Well, I was impressed with the production at the bottom of the order for the Hawkeyes. Kyle Huxdorf um, and Braden Frazier have been tremendous for Iowa in this tournament, but Iowa has what everybody wants. And that is a bevy of arms to go to in a tournament situation. And that's what makes them dangerous because they have pitching. Their pitching is lined up. This new format has been great for the teams that stay on the winning side because they're guaranteed days off for rest. And that's why I think Maryland and Iowa have an advantage in this tournament because if this gets to Sunday and they're both in the championship, if this plays out and none of the other teams go on a run, 
I think they're automatically in the NCAA tournament and they can set up their rotation like a midweek game where they want to win and they'll do everything they can, but they won't do so to compromise their rotation for if it was during a regular season on the weekend or in this instance for the NCAA tournament. So what the Hawkeyes can do is they're hitting one through nine, they're getting production, but they have the pitching and the back end of their bullpen is outstanding. And when you get into these games, when you get into a tournament game, you're going to have to win one run. You're going to have to scrape one across and you're going to need somebody to come in and nail it down. The Hawkeyes have those arms. When I'm hearing you talk about Iowa baseball right now, then it has me wondering a little bit with the versatility that you're describing and the pitching staff and the hitters one through nine. Is Iowa the team in the Big Ten that right now may have the highest ceiling out of anyone, anyone we're looking at? From a tournament standpoint on paper, maybe. But I don't discount what Maryland is doing. Maryland has performed like champions all year. Um, I think that if they're winning, like we discussed, doing the little things, playing defense, getting runners over, driving them in, pitching well enough to win games, they're there. But Iowa's coming on at the right time. So I think in a tournament setting, if their pitchers are able to stro- throw strikes, Brody Breck, he did a good enough job yesterday. It, the wheels almost kind of came loose. But he was able to rein it back in to keep Iowa in the game so that offense could take over and come back. I think that makes him dangerous. Both those teams, along with Indiana, I think are the three that are going to get into the NCAA tournament. And they can do some damage. I really do. You mentioned Brody Breck there and Luke Sennard. He, between the two of them, it seemed like they were both scuffling a little bit early in the game and started to find their stride a little bit. Do you think either guy was maybe closer to having his best stuff? Well, I think both were showing some signs of nerves. This is a big venue. There were fans here there was a raucous crowd Luke Sennard's got a big league breaking ball it's that plain and simple I've seen it it's one of the best in the league if not the best in the country they started to pitch well enough at the end to keep their teams in it not every pitcher is going to have their best stuff I don't think either did but they did well enough and did exactly what their coaches asked of them pitch a good enough ball game to give their team a chance to win and each team had a chance from the middle of that game on a lot of us, Scott, have been trying to figure out like what happened with Michigan State. They seemed really strong early in the season, and then things flattened out for a while for the Spartans. And now here, closing the regular season, and now through the Big Ten tournament, we're seeing the Michigan State that it felt like there was going to be potential to be. Is there a player that's been more vital for Jake Boss than what he's seen from his closer, Wyatt Rush, who you know did more than just close the game yesterday? Well, what I'm seeing from them is they're a team like a playoff team. They were fighting for their life for the last two weeks, and then they've carried that into this Big Ten tournament, and they've done an outstanding job in the tournament of just being scrappy. I don't think anybody that wants to play them, but the top four in their order are as good as any in the conference, and they've caused havoc. And I think Trent Farquhar has really stepped up. He's the toughest in the league to strike out, but he's been somebody that is really – steadied that lineup and has been in the middle of everything. Brock Radenberg's hit all year. Yeah, you can count him. But I think with what Frank, Jeb, and Farquhar are doing at the top of that order, that's been a key to their success, and that's why they won yesterday. And Michigan State's believing in themselves because their back's been against the wall for so long that they're playing with house money. They They know nobody expects anything from them, so they have nothing to lose, so they're playing with reckless abandon. And you cannot credit enough the job that Jake Boss has done with this young team. They had a rough year last year. He was bringing young players along. They've continued that this year, but they're starting to lay the foundation to be good for years to come. And the Spartans are going to be a tough team because they're playing with reckless abandon. Wouldn't anticipate that Nebraska's going to have to worry about wide rush tonight after going four and two thirds yesterday. So an elimination game here, win or go home. What do you expect in that one tonight? Well, I expect this to be a knockdown drag out for the reason I mentioned for Michigan State. They have nothing to lose, so they're going to play free and easy. Nebraska, it's home field. I mean, we had 8,000 people here yesterday. They're going to show up in droves, and it becomes a pretty exciting atmosphere for anyone, and they feed off of that. But they've got two of the best players in the Big Ten right at the top. Bryce Matthews and Max Anderson have done extremely well. Charlie Fisher has come up with a big home run, um, and Gabe Swenson has done an outstanding job. Of, of, of providing the power. This lineup is good. The question for Nebraska and Michigan State is, do you have the arms? And that's what happens when you get to this side of the bracket and you've got to play and you've got to find the arm. And oftentimes, 
somebody has to step up that didn't during the regular season that has a relatively fresh arm. And so you're going to have to find that. Can you predict it? No, but we're going to find out tonight. And I expect it to be a barn burner of a game. And Indiana is coming off of a loss. Michigan is coming off of a win. So what do you expect between that dynamic and what's going to be an elimination game there today? Well, I think Indiana is in the best position just from their lineup. They can hit one through nine. They were towards the end until they ran into Michigan State. But Jeff Mercer, ever since the Maryland series, has had this team playing well. And they're seeing the importance of what Maryland does well, meaning the little things. And if the Indiana team can do that, they're going to be dangerous as well. I think Jeff Mercer has a good team coming in. Tracy Smith has a young team that he's getting to play well at the end of the year. But I think Indiana's in the best position, but that's why they play the game. Uh, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, Michigan may come out with a good start and start swinging the sticks and playing very well. And that's what happens when you get to an elimination game. And if I'm Jeff Mercer, I'm going to feel a little more comfortable with one more win to further my NCAA resume. Because let's be honest, all of these coaches are a little gun shy after what <laughs> happened to Rutgers last year. All of us thought Rutgers was in. They weren't. The NCAA found a way to keep them out. I think all the coaches want to win as many games as possible because it's much like in a game you do not want to leave the call up to the umpire. None of these coaches want to leave the call up to the NCAA committee with a middle resume. They want to be able to have an emphatic exclamation point and say, yeah, we're in and here we are. So I think that's what Indiana's playing for right now. But these are going to be exciting games. And because this is why you play them, it's an elimination. Anything could happen. All right, Scott Pose, as we sit here right now on Friday morning, how many Big Ten teams are you confident will make the NCAA tournament? I say three. I think all three will be in, um, provided that past president is what the NCAA committee uses. And that's the wild card in this. The NCAA committee used a different formula last year, but even if they used the formula last year, I think these teams are in. So what they did was RPI was important, but last 10 was important. And then they looked at the resume against quad one wins versus quad two. I think all three of those teams pass all the tests that they used. So I won't give a qualifier. Three teams from the Big Ten will get in. It will be Maryland, Iowa, Indiana, provided that nobody steals that guaranteed bid coming through. And it's based on the criteria that has been shown by the NCAA committee in the past. If they break out a new criteria, then anything can happen. But I do think three teams will get in from the Big Ten. Well, Scott, we're going to continue watching right here on the Big Ten Network during the baseball tournament. Great work so far on the calls. And uh, congratulations on the stamina getting through last night, man. We're going to keep watching. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's a lot of fun. I wouldn't miss this for the world. We're going to see some good baseball, and it's going to be a good time. No doubt about that. And we continue to talk about the Iowa Hawkeyes a bit as the Hawkeyes Athletic Department announced this morning that Athletic Director Gary Barter will retire after 17 years leading Hawkeye Athletics. The success on the field has certainly been undeniable. Four NCAA team titles, 27 Big Ten team titles in the time that Gary Barter has been there. Unprecedented fundraising success and facility upgrades, hundreds of millions of dollars throughout. He's also been no stranger to controversy during his time there. He's navigated various lawsuits from former coaches, former players, athletic department staff, but the tremendous athletic, academic, and the spectacular fan engagement will certainly make it for uh, quite the gem, I think, for whomever ends up replacing Gary Barta as Iowa AD. Where 12th seeded Northwestern travels to Tuscaloosa to take on 5th seeded Alabama. It's a strength versus strength matchup with the Crimson Tide sporting one of the best ERA numbers in the country while the Cats rank in the top 20 in both batting average and on base percentage. With that in mind, I mean, you know, you really want to hear me talk by myself about batting average, on base percentage, all that silly stuff? No, you want an expert. So we got Sammy Netling on the horn here to help us talk about her Cats and what they are looking to do here in the Super Regionals. And Sammy, I'm I'm wondering a bit about Northwestern's mindset here because so many of us were, were really worked up about the fact that they didn't get a top eight seed. It's a different task that Kate Drohan has, but I wonder how do they end up potentially using that as fuel to maybe lead them into hostile territory here? 
Yeah, it's definitely not uh, an area that they, um, you know, they're comfortable with having a chip on their shoulder. They've kind of done it throughout their careers. They were definitely hoping that their body of work had had done enough to secure a, a top eight seed to be able to host regionals and supers. You know, when you look at eighth in the RPI, third toughest non-conference schedule in the country, five wins against, you know, teams with, with a top 25 RPI, two-way champion in the Big Ten. Um, I felt like all the bracketologists were kind of leaning towards putting them in that top eight bucket. Um, and it, I think you kind of see it on their faces when their name was announced in that 12 spot. But definitely, you know, familiar territory for them. They've done it throughout their careers. They had to go on the road last year in Supers uh, against a tough AS you team to play in a hostile environment and i think you know they they're they're used to it they're used to to being the underdog um and they're going to use any type of you know mental edge that they can get to to attack a, a crimson tide team this weekend how much does the the experience that they have here with you know seniors and some super seniors even that that have been through a lot of these things together before how big of a factor is that going into what what can be a very raucous place in tuscaloosa yeah, I think, um, you know, there's there's a handful of venues in collegiate softball that truly, you know, give home field advantage um, quite, quite an emphasis. Tuscaloosa is one of them, if not at the top of that list. It is known to be single-handedly the hardest place to play in our sport. And I think you look at, again, Coach Rohan has, has preached about the experience, the level-headedness, the composure of this team all season long, even going back, like we said, Supers having to go on the road at ASU last year to, to crawl their, scratch their way into Oklahoma City. And I think they've specifically set themselves up to be ready for this moment, right? They, they went to Clearwater and played four top 25 teams early on in the season. They played at Clemson. They went back and played in Oklahoma City during the regular season to get ready to face those hostile, high energy, big stake type of environments. This definitely is, is I think, going to be their toughest test yet. But I do think they are they are battle tested. They lean so heavily on the veteran leadership of that core fifth year group. And I think, you know, just like this past weekend, we, we saw their composure really elevate themselves to to take care of business in the regional championship. And I'm excited to see this group, you know, end on a high note and really go attack Alabama in, again, a, a very hostile, high energy, but just a fun place to play mm -hmm. if, if you're a college softball fan and a college softball player. So what would you diagnose then as a couple of maybe bullet points that are going to be keys to success for Northwestern? Yeah, I think they're they are susceptible to the long ball. Their pitching staff, they, they know it. They, it's part of their identity. They accept it. You cannot give up the free bases, right? When you do give up the long ball, you cannot afford to have additional base runners on the, on the paths when you do. That's number one, specifically when you look at their attack from the circle. And then I think they have to set the tone early, right? They're going to be the visiting team. They're going to hit first. Can you throw a first punch early on in a game? They are so good at crawling themselves out of holes late in the game and just, just outlasting teams. But I just think that margin for error this weekend is smaller. It is so much smaller. And so taking care of the little things at the beginning of the game, in the middle, and at the end, right? They're going to have to play a complete seven inning, if not seven plus innings um, of work this weekend. I think setting the tone early is crucial. And then just being able to, to get some valuable innings from their bullpen. The depth in their bullpen has been one of their biggest advantages, one of the biggest differences from the 2022 team to the 2023 team. I think they're going to need to have some efficient, valuable innings from Boyd, from Cammy Henry, to just eat up some of those innings in a three-game series to keep Danielle fresh and allow her to continue to attack the strike zone against the Crimson Tide. There's reports, Sammy, that the Alabama ace Montana Fouts is expected to be available for the Supers. So how big of a deal is game one in this series? I think there's a stat that like 81% of teams that win game one punch their ticket to Oklahoma City, right? It, it is so crucial, especially on the road. And especially, like you said, when the depth in the bullpens for both of these teams has been a question mark this year, right? Montana and Danielle are one and two in terms of active NCAA career strikeout leaders. There is, there is not 
another pitcher in the country that carries the workload or or the importance of their programs other than Daniel Williams and Montana Fouts. And so that's why I said, you know, again, it's going to be crucial for the Northwestern bullpen to be able to, to you know, eat and, and take up valuable innings. We saw the Crimson Tide bullpen step up in regionals, right? Torrance through 18 and a half complete scoreless innings in regionals they stepped up to that challenge and we don't know you know how long Fouts is going to be able to go if she's going to start game one etc I think you know I'm sure coach Drohan has prepared for for all the arms in the Crimson Tide bullpen but you just think about those two are such pillars right We, we 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 saw the graphic pitching is is their strong suit it is their strength and so if you can win game one if you can prevent potentially, you know, long, um, um, you know, erroneous innings from getting away from you and, and having to have Danielle throw 100 plus innings, th- uh, 100 plus pitches, three games in a row, that is going to be crucial. I think game one is, is just the, the statistics alone tell you it, it, it is just incrementally important to being able to punch your ticket and be a final eight team in Oklahoma City. Well, it would certainly be more fun if Northwestern were hosting in Evanston, but if there's anywhere, any team that we would watch in this environment and look forward to seeing how they handle it, it is Kate Drohan squad. We know you'll watch it closely as well, Sammy. Outstanding work all throughout the softball coverage here on the Big Ten Network. Look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to Big Ten Today, where we turn our attention to track and field. The Michigan women's outdoor track team brought home the Big Ten title two weeks ago. It was the eighth title in program history as they were led by Big Ten Women's Athlete of the Championships, Zaya Holman, and Big Ten Women's Track Coach of the Year, Kevin Sullivan. This gets us into our big interview, and I have the man himself, the coach of Michigan Women's Track, two-time now, really in the same season, but two-time Big Ten Women's Track and Field Coach of the Year, Kevin Sullivan, with me at this point. And Kevin, I really appreciate you joining me here on Big Ten today. I'm curious for, for you in returning to your alma mater, when, when you got the opportunity to join up with Michigan Track and Field and Cross Country, what were your initial expectations for yourself? Did you think you'd still be here nine years later stacking championships? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like this was as I as I was got into my professional coaching career, this was the spot I wanted to get back to. You know, you you know, you know, a lot of a lot of times coaches are jumping from one position to another, or using them positions as stepping stones to a, another position. For me, I, I never looked at this as a stepping stone position. It was where I wanted to end up. It's my alma mater. I've got you know a huge love for the institution. So. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those things where we want to continue to stack championships. That's what I, I love doing. I love I love being being on top of the pile as a as a Michigan Wolverine. Now, what gave you confidence coming into the season? Because this is now the sixth time that the Michigan women have been able to combine both the indoor and the outdoor Big Ten championship. But I know you've been building things kind of steadily in your image in the couple of years that you've been running both programs. So, what gave you confidence coming into the season that your squad could achieve at this level? Well, I think you just hit on it. Like we've been growing different areas of our program over the last couple of years. I think what we've seen, I think, I think we felt we were, we were close last year. We had all the right people and all the right pieces to put together a championship run. We just didn't quite have the experience or I think the confidence to really, um, to really go after it. And I think that's one of the things we really saw a shift in this year. You know, we added a couple of new pieces, but for the most part, it was the same team we had last year, but there was a, there was a different confidence around the team where they just believed they could win. And so when they got put in tough situations at the big 10 championships, both indoors and outdoors, they just stepped up and responded and competed and, and, you know, started grabbing points that maybe last year they would have crumbled a little bit. And uh, that was the big, that was a big difference for us this year, a big just mental shift for the team. I've gotten to talk to coach Karen Dennis from your, your rival institution, but she's a hall of famer and she ran both programs at Ohio state. And I remember her just telling me a little bit about the, you know, the monumental undertaking it, it was just kind of running both men's and women's in simultaneous order. How big of an undertaking is it for you as you've gotten to grow into the role a bit, but now everything, hundreds of athletes are under your watch? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, it's definitely a challenge, um, you know, especially you've got 
we've got two teams that are kind of in different stages of development. You know, we have our women's team that is definitely, a, you know, they're very championship minded. Our men's team is still, you know, we're still growing towards that point. And so managing the expectations can be a little bit, a little bit challenging, um, you know, and being able to communicate kind of different messaging to, to each group. Um, I'm really fortunate though. I have a great staff around me. You know, my, my direct responsibility is coaching men's distance runners. So, um, you know, I really rely on my assistant coaches to, you know, just continue to bring good positive energy, um, have a consistent message for the entire team. And, you know, without good people around you, you're never going to be successful. So it's not really, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, the director, but it's just about surrounding myself with good people and good athletes and then letting them take care of business. Now, which have you found to be more nerve wracking? Is it when you have your team pursuing a, a championship as a team, as you were just able to attain in the Big Ten? Or is it the stage you're at right now? You're out of town, you're on the road because you have individual athletes pursuing national championships. Which one is, is more nerve wracking for you as a coach? I mean, I think the nerves are a little bit different. You know, obviously we put a, a huge emphasis on on trying to win conference championships and and in the midst of that battle, I mean, it is it is definitely nerve wracking, especially, you know, where the position we were in, where we're, we were coming from behind on the third day of the championship. Um, it, it was it was an all day nerve wracking situation that we're in until until the last event. This is a little bit different when we've got individuals. We've got a little bit more downtime. Um, you know, you're nervous for each individual athlete, but it's it's maybe not it's not the same in, in the sense that you know we have kind of the elite of the elite on our team here, and so they really know how to step up and compete on the day. And I think when you're in a more of a championship fight. It's just you're hoping that everything comes together on on the day. So it's 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 nerve wracking both ways, but it's a little bit different in, in each situation. You put together a historic Hall of Fame career in your own right as a, a distance runner representing Michigan, representing Canada. And so you know what it takes to make the Olympic Games and what that's like once you arrive there. What's your approach as a coach to discussing Olympic aspirations with your athletes? Well, I think part of the. Uh, Part of it is I, I try to draw on my experiences without necessarily expecting that each athlete has to operate exactly like me. But, you know, I'm fortunate that I have, you know, a, a wealth of experience both at the collegiate and the international level. So for both of our, you know, our athletes that are that are just trying to, you know, squeak out a few points at a Big Ten championship to our athletes that have aspirations to go professional, I can I can bring an experience and a knowledge you know, to help guide and be a resource for them um, for however, however much they want to use me as a resource. I just try not to force it on them. You know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's been a long time since I was at the Olympics. So, you know, we have athletes come in and they don't, un, they don't know what my former athletic pedigree is. <laughs> they only look at me as, as coach. So sometimes it's like, you got to remind, you got to remind them sometimes of, uh, you know, Hey, I've been there and done that before. And then once they start realizing that, then, there's more of a tendency to come to you for for that knowledge and and um, and insight. We got to make sure Ward Manuel gets a little something stitched on a wall somewhere, maybe hangs <laughs> a plaque or two. I mean, you accomplished a thing or two in your time there in Ann Arbor. Uh, you have uh, one of your current sprinters, Zaya Holman, who became a, a viral sensation, of course, a couple of years ago. Very first race that that she ran, first relay was a four by four. She gets the baton as the anchor leg four seconds behind the competition and comes back to win. And now it feels like everyone in the world has seen that image. Over the last couple of years, though, there was a lot for her to live up to. And it seems like she certainly met those expectations. Well, what's impressed you about the way that she's been able to, after, you know, potentially she could have peaked early in that moment, being able to continue to achieve at such a high level? Yeah, I mean, I think the really cool thing about Zaya Holman, this is I've, I've, told this to the team a couple of times when we've been in situations where we may haven't had a had a, a great competition or we've had some athletes that have been under the weather or for whatever reason haven't performed well. And the one thing about Zaya is like Zaya is just a competitor. Like she knows how to win races. Um, and that's the really cool thing is that it doesn't matter whether she's, you know, going up against a 49 point girl or a 53 point girl. She just knows how to win. And she's going to, she's going to either be, at the front of that group or be mixing it up uh, in the lead. There's just a competitiveness about her that you don't see in every, every athlete. And that can be really infectious. Um, and when she starts getting on a roll, it really, it really feeds the rest of the team. And she was a huge, 
a huge reason why at this Big Ten Championships, we started building a lot of momentum. She was a couple of her races early in the day where, you know, she she finished a second in the 200 and, and she's supposed to finish fourth or fifth. And all of a sudden, you know, other athletes start realizing like, hey, I can I can do these same things. I can step up on the day. And that's the really cool thing is it's just like she knows how to compete. Um, it builds a lot of excitement on the team and a lot of confidence that, you know, our coaches know what they're doing and they're preparing our athletes well and we can go out and perform on the day too. That's a degree of leadership that probably goes a little bit underappreciated in track because we maybe think of it as this individual sport, but when the team can feed off of a competitor like that, it's pretty cool. And it's been really nice to watch the way that Zaya has become, you know, a brand, but has still kept things balanced seemingly in that regard. Being able to sort of handle the stage in the way that she has, what do you think her, her potential is, not only here domestically, but maybe as an international athlete? I think I think what you've seen is you know Zai's taken a step forward this year in a lot of different areas. She's gotten a lot faster over the 200. That has definitely helped her 400, where she's now a 50 point uh, 50 point competitor, um, which is something she's been striving for. So I think you know the upside is definitely there. I think being able to manage all the expectation and all the outside influence and the NIL opportunities, you know, all of those things. Um, and this isn't just a Zaya Holman thing. This is a for many student athletes now that are trying to navigate this this new NCAA. Um, it can be a challenge in figuring out okay what what are my priorities and then what do I need to achieve success. And so, you know, being able to um, take the opportunities um, and the earnings, but also realize that hey, my success on the track is is ultimately what's going to fuel my future athletic career for the next whatever that is for six, eight, 10 years. Um, it is a challenge, I think, for student athletes to balance that. And, and you know, Zaya is doing a good job of that. I mean, I think with anything, there's all, it's always a work in progress, and she, but she's gotten much better at that, I think, this year, even than she has been in the, in the past couple years. So um, it, it's definitely, she's an example that, that our athletes can look to of, of, you know, how to try and manage and navigate this, this um, new athletic landscape for college athletes. Well, there are a number of Wolverines athletes advancing through the NCAA East preliminary quarterfinals. More of that coming this weekend. So, Kevin, thanks and, and best of luck to you and the athletes taking the, the track and the field events this weekend. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Go Blue. We're back on Big Ten today and tomorrow. The men's lacrosse NCAA tournament continues with the final four teams. Fifth seed at Penn State takes on the top seeded Duke at noon. And it's the Nittany Lions' first NCAA Final Four appearance since 2019 as they look to advance to the national championship. On the women's side, Northwestern owns the top seed and they'll face fifth-seeded Denver today at 3 p.m. Eastern. The Cats are on a mission to win their first NCAA championship since 2012, which capped off a stretch where they won seven of the eight titles from 2005 to 2012. If they win today, they'll face the winner of Syracuse and BC on Sunday. Very much looking forward to that and to help me break all those things down. The man who knows this sport as well as anyone, our guy, Dean Linky, play-by-play -play announcer here for us at the Big Ten Network. And Dean, we've been watching the, the program that, that's been built there in Evanston for a number of years at this point. And so Northwestern, number one overall seed with Coach Amati Hillman. And I'm wondering... From that perspective, the matchup they have today against Denver, is this, is this the type of opponent that you feel is comparable with the others on the opposing side of the Final Four bracket? Yeah, Denver's legit. They have not lost a single game this year. So you've got one team in Northwestern. Their only loss is the first game of the season against Syracuse and another team in Denver that's 22-0. and The last time Denver lost a game was last year in the second round of the NCAA tournament to Boston College, who sits on the other side. So Denver has two of the best defenders in the country, but they'll have to face five of the best attackers in the country for Northwestern, which is, I think, the most complete team in the Final Four. When you see the way that the Cats have played through the first couple of rounds here, how well do you really think Northwestern is playing heading into the Final Four? Phenomenal. I mean, I got to give Michigan credit. Hannah Nielsen, who's one of the all-time greats who played at Northwestern, 
They gave Northwestern all they could handle in the first round of the NCAA tournament, eight to seven. And you talk about the ultimate wake up call. I know that's a little bit cliche, but Michigan kind of shook them to their core. Northwestern responded with a blowout performance of Loyola, Maryland. I think they're ready to take down Denver. And I think all of us are hoping that it's a rematch of game number one, a game one at Syracuse by one lonely goal, 16 to 15. I think that's the matchup we're really hoping for, but it won't be easy because Boston College is pretty good on the other side as well. <laughs> I had a chance to talk to Kelly Mate Hiller recently, and she was telling me about the way that she tries to coach the game, and part of this just goes kind of through her family lineage and being around different versions of hockey and field hockey in years past, that she tries to bring a creativity to the sport. And I'm wondering from your observations, how does that creativity manifest itself on the field? Oh, it's incredible. I mean, one of the things that Kelly and Monty Hiller, first of all, she's transformed a little bit. You talked about that run she made, and then by Northwestern standards, they had a little bit of a lull. But I think I owe it a lot to her creativity, particularly the notion she's like, wait, I want to look for lacrosse players that are also playing other sports. As you talked about the fact that she likes hockey and ice hockey players, Kelly Amante Hiller was a big time soccer player. But I think the most creative thing that Kelly Amante Hiller has done in the last few years, and I need to remind everybody, Northwestern's now been to four in a row, final four. So it's not like they just disappeared. I do think this is the year they do win it again and get their eighth title. But I think her creativity kind of comes from transforming herself a little bit as a coach, adjusting to the new athlete and working with the new athlete, particularly going through COVID and everything else. I give high props to Kelly Amante Hiller and her husband, Scott, who really make an amazing one-two combo as the head coach and associate head coach. They are just a spectacular yin and yang. And I think the brain power of Kelly Amante Hiller, who, by the way, is the only person I think that's in the Lacrosse Hall of Fame as a player and as a coach, hmm. and she's getting ready to coach the USA U-20s again. She's done so much for the sport. We would need a whole nother show to truly break down her creativity. And when you think of the lineage of Northwestern, it, it seems odd that a player who's been as successful as Izzy Skane is still number three right now, climbing the rankings of all-time scorers, but it just shows how great the talent has been at that program over the years. And now another finalist tip for, for Izzy Skane with the Tuarton on the line. I'm wondering, do you think that it's hers to lose, or could you see maybe Aaron Koykendall kind of pushing her from a voting perspective? You know, that's my biggest problem with it is I'm worried that those two could split votes and somebody from one of the other four teams that are in there or somebody from North Carolina could slide in. But I'm on the skein train for the Toraton. <laughs> but I will say if Aaron Koykendall won it, that would make me think that everybody watching is like, wow, what a brain she's got, her ability to not just score but also feed. By the way, speaking of the skein train, keep an eye for an announcement. A source has told me that She's going to make it official that she's coming back next year. And by the way, Aaron Koykendall also can come back next year. And I also heard that Molly La Liberty, who did not win goalkeeper of the year, Sterling was great at Maryland, but I think Molly La Liberty might be one of the best goalies in the country. She might be able to come back next year as well. And of course, Kelly Amante's niece, Dylan Amante, could also come back next year. So not only do I think they can win it this year, I think they could maybe win it again next year and start another train where, like you mentioned, they won seven out of eight in, you know, in that run from 2007 on. I see you're breaking news here on Big Ten today, Dean Lincoln, liking the sounds of that. And when I did get to speak to Kelly Monte Hiller, one thing that she didn't necessarily like was her team's performance on the whole when they met up with Syracuse in that season opener. Now, she felt like things kind of got stronger as the game were on, but didn't feel like they were at their best. What were your observations of that game and the potential that they could meet up again here? Well, in that game, it's worth mentioning that Haley Radigan, a player that I haven't mentioned yet, who right now leads the nation among active players in scoring, the transfer from Mercer, who's actually scored more goals than Izzy Skane. We probably don't talk enough about her because she's first team all Big Ten and part of those five attackers. She didn't play in that game, and their best defender, Kendall Helpern, didn't play in that game. Those are two all Big Ten selections that make a difference on the field for Northwestern. And then also, you know, Kelly Amante Hiller, no one's going to judge their team tougher than her, but they were down by four at half in that game, and three times they tied it up in the second half, again, without those two key players. And then since, as you know, they haven't lost a game. So I like their chances if they do get a shot at Syracuse. But going back to our original point, it's not going to be easy. Denver is legit. 
They hold teams to low scores. They have the two of the best defenders that I already talked about. And, you know, they haven't lost a game in a long, long time. So they don't, they don't even know what it's like to lose. So it's not going to be easy today at 3 o'clock uh, at Wake Med Soccer Park in Cary, North Carolina. It's a lineup that Kelly Monte Hiller has. It's been through so much together over the years. And so you do end up building chemistry as you experience different things as teammates. Do you feel like that chemistry is a big part of why, to your point, they've been able to win 19 straight games since that opener? Sir, yes, sir. The joy on this team. And I was blessed to have a front row seat, particularly at the Big Ten Championships in Ohio State. I went to the practice on Cinco de Mayo where they were actually throwing lacrosse balls at tacos to win prizes. It was incredible. I mean, they are all in. It's a unit from the goalie with La Liberty to Kendall Halpern defensively. Then you've got the Sams and Sam Smith and Sam White on the draw, which is arguably the most important part of Wims of the Cross winning the draw. And Samantha Smith is one of the best. Samantha White is one of the best wings. And then the five attackers up top, when you're talking about Koykendall, when you're talking about Skeen, when you're talking about the Big Ten Freshman of the Year in Taylor, when you're talking about Radigan and um, uh, and also Dylan Amante. And then Al Hansen is no slack as well. Now, a lot of those players could be cocky. You've been around elite-level athletes. They could be on their own. But Skeen, who scored 98 goals two years ago before the ACL, could easily have 110 goals. But she's unselfish, like Koykendall, and that's all about that chemistry. They love each other. And, again, you hear that all the time, but they truly love each other from their star players all the way down to player number 25. We know you'll be watching that closely when you head out there today to see if Northwestern can make that national championship game appearance. Let's flip to the men where Penn State is hoping to make a national championship game appearance themselves this weekend. And it seemed to me, Dean, that because Michigan men's lacrosse kind of came out of nowhere and had such a strong finish, won the Big Ten tournament, you know, dominated Maryland, make some program history, I don't necessarily think Penn State has been covered to the same extent. Does this seem like a Penn State men's squad that's maybe a bit underrated? Yeah, but they know what to do in this situation. You know, they were just there in 2019 in Philadelphia, the final four, they lost to the eventual champion in Virginia and Virginia's back to try to win another one. I think they've got six overall. So uh, obviously, you know, they've got to get by Duke, but yeah, Penn state deserves a lot more credit, but they at least know what it's like to be there. A lot of the players that were on that team in 2019, a lot of them are still there. So, you know, I, I am actually really impressed on the Big Ten men's lacrosse side because not only did Michigan make that run to win the Big Ten title, they won some games in the NCAAs. So did Johns Hopkins. And, of course, Penn State finds himself in the Final Four. And you can't forget that Maryland also made an appearance in the NCAA tournament. So four of the six Big Ten men's lacrosse teams made the NCAA tournament. And that might be one of the reasons why you didn't hear enough about Penn State. But Penn State is legit. And Jeff Tambroni leading his team for the second time, to your point, to this Final Four appearance here. And they were the overwhelming favorite back in 2019, ended up getting upset in the semis. But I do wonder, with the, the roles being flipped here, if Penn State can pull this off this weekend against Duke, make the national championship game on Memorial Day, you know, we saw Jeff Tambroni at Cornell make a number of Final Fours and national championship game appearances. Does he re-enter that conversation amongst the best coaches in the sport if they can upset Duke? In my opinion, he never left the conversation. Mm. You know, I mean, what he did at Cornell and what he's done in short order at Penn State will always make him one of the great coaches uh, for sure. So, yeah, he's already in that conversation and always will be. And he's such a pleasure to talk to, as you might know as well. He, he's, he's a big-time person and a big-time coach and loved by everybody on the staff and everybody at Penn State. National championships on the line for the Big Ten Conference. Looking forward to everything you're going to watch and cover about it as well, Dean. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much.